If I have attention economy, seven trillion dollars in size, why on earth would we not have movement economy built around value of physical activity? And why would it be any smaller than attention economy? Healthcare costs are ballooning and health is extremely valuable. Productivity is extremely valuable. Mental health is extremely valuable. Extending people's health span and making them economically and physically active for longer is extremely valuable. So like, hmm, you know what? We shouldn't be thinking about building a product. We should be thinking about building the whole new economy. Welcome to Steady Lads. In this episode, I interview Oleg, co-founder of Sweat Economy. We always talk about in crypto that we need to build apps that normal people actually want to use. Well, Sweat Economy has done that. Their app has 140 million users and was the number two most downloaded fitness and health app in 2022. Obviously, that's crazy impressive. And with this episode, I wanted to know how has Sweat Economy achieved so much success where most are falling short? Most, most crypto apps have not even close to that many users. Not even like they buy and far dwarf like 99.99% of all crypto apps. So how are they achieving so much success when so many others are falling short? Some interesting things in this episode. First off, unlike other models built around fitness and exercise that maybe we've seen in the past, Sweat, the token for Sweat Economy, is actually deflationary, which I found incredibly impressive. Secondly, Oleg talks a lot about the economy of movement and how he believes one day it could be a $7 trillion economy all on its own. And for reference, the entire crypto market cap is like just over $1 trillion. So he's saying the economy of movement can one day on its own be a $7 trillion industry. And actually, by the end of, by the, end of the episode, I was believing exactly what he, I, I like. I bought into that completely. I was like, yes, you are right. <laughs> it could be. Um, and third, there are just some really interesting insights that Oleg is able to bring to the conversation, specifically around the crypto market and crypto apps, uh, just given that he has built 140 million user app. Like he, he knows a thing or two, right? And so he's able to bring some insights into the space on some things that maybe crypto projects should be paying attention to and should be doing that they aren't currently that would help them get more users and get more success within the space. Overall, this was an incredibly interesting episode and one that I think is going to be insightful for anyone in the crypto space. I am really excited to learn about what you're building and uh, what has been built. So can you briefly explain what is Sweat Economy? Big question. So I'm going to have to go 10 years back believe it or not. We started in 2014 and we wanted to build a currency backed by the value of physical activity. We call it sweat coin. But when it came to implementing and building it on blockchain, we stumbled into an issue, which was in 2014, there was only one blockchain, Bitcoin, and forking it, building on it was slow, cumbersome, expensive, and we realized that it's just not a chain to build on. No smart contracts, nothing. So we kind of took a step back and went, ooh, we're a little too early. And in early 2015, we met with Vitalik, who started making you know, all these meetups, traveling around the world and attracting crowds of like 10, 15 people and got mobbed by like three at the end of the meetup uh, to have a conversation. So we caught up with him and we got excited about building on Ethereum and spent some time really digging into it. And it was too early because, again, it was sort of a year and a half before their ICO and like two and a bit years before they even went live. So we kind of went, shit, what do we do? And we decided to go centralized because there was no other option. And we kind of went, hmm, you know what, Ethereum appeared now. I'm sure that in six months there will be, you know, a chain that will jump on. Ha, ha, ha. Little did we know that it took until 2021 to, you know, uh, for blockchain technology to caught up with our scale. Because by then we had more than 100 million users on Sweatcoin. It was still centralized. It was very much health and fitness app. Sweat coins that we were rewarding people with uh, were centralized, so basically not a crypto token, not liquid, cannot be uh, could not be traded uh, uh, on exchanges. And then all of a sudden in 2011, uh, you know, kind of all of this raft of amazing tech appeared. 
Solana, Near, Avalanche, BNB, Polygon, and we analyzed more than 10 chains, 14 to be exact, and we settled on Near. And when we settled on Near, we realized that it was too bloody late to shift Swift coin onto blockchain, more than 100 million users. You can't just say from day one to day two, all of a sudden it's different tokenomics, different user experience. Um, you know, we kind of went, hmm, we have to create Sweat Economy, which is effectively a Web3 business that grew out of Sweat coin. And, you know, we launched Sweat, we launched Sweat Wallet at the um, NearCon in September 2022, and the rest is history. We are now ninth widest held token in the world, 13th most actively used token in the world, and Sweat Wallet is the top five DAP um, in Web3 across all chains, all categories of DAPs. So, you know, kind of an amazing, an absolutely amazing result so far. Sweat economy and then the the app you have, those are two different things. Can you explain the differences between those things? Yeah, exactly. So sweat coin is a health and fitness sort of pedometer with benefits. Um, it tracks and verifies your movement. And if it is genuine and it goes through our draconian movement verification algorithm that sort of consists of, sort of three layers of defense, then you convert it into sweat coins if you have not opted into crypto or you convert it into sweat if you click a couple of buttons and you decided that you want to convert your physical activity into crypto token sweat and this crypto token you manage in sweat wallet so you have health and fitness application that tracks your steps gamifies it you know kind of sets goals etc cetera, etc cetera. And then you have fintech app called Sweat Wallet, where you manage your sweat, and not just sweat, but any token for the moment just on Near. But we are in the process of leveraging technology that Near protocol is working on, so that we will become this year already within second half of the year we will become a multi-chain wallet, and you're going to be able to keep, transact, exchange, and trade tokens on at least few EVM chains by the end of the year, but we think that we're going to be supporting more or less all the chains in 2025. So what's the advantage for the user to be like, hey, I want to convert it into Sweat, uh, the, the crypto token versus the in-app token? So, I mean, think of it as a game with two currencies. You know, one is easy come, easy go. You earn it through the gameplay. You spend it on a gameplay. It, it's, you know, kind of, it's, it's more of a, an, an emotional thing. Like, you know, kind of, you accumulate, you spend, but, you know, it doesn't really have tangible financial value. You cannot take sweet coins and go to an exchange and actually exchange it to stables and sort of exit into fiat. So a lot of people, they actually play both. So the way it works is that if you opt into crypto, we convert first 5,000 steps of your day into sweat. And after that, you earn sweat coins. So, you know, you end up having both currencies. One is a hard, cold cash that basically gives you the value of your physical activity. And another one helps you to gamify and participate in various different things, support charities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, okay. So sweat coins is the app one, and then sweat would be the crypto. Absolutely, and it's traded on twenty different exchanges already. And yeah, it's uh, as I said, it's really uh, kind of going mass market. We are ninth biggest uh, token in terms of number of token holders. Okay. And then, so that token, the first 5,000 steps you do in the app, you earn sweat. And then after that, you're earning sweat coin. And there's no way to, after that to earn sweat anymore? Uh, not at the moment. We are very carefully listening to our audience and we're hearing some really interesting inputs because our mission is to make the world more physically active. And because physical activity is immensely valuable, it is a very, very good business. And the more people walk, the more we accomplish our mission. So we're actually toying with the idea of changing slightly the 
the way we will be allocating or you will be earning sweat in the future to make people, you know, kind of push themselves as close as possible to that 10,000, you know, kind of magic line that, you know, we all need to be. But you're based in the U.S., and I'm sure that you have U.S.-based audience. Do you know how many steps an average American walks per day? (laughs) I have no idea. What is it? It's ballpark 3,000. Oh, dang. So it's really low. So even 5,000 cap is already pushing people way past their averages. But we feel that we need to kind of push you know, kind of push ourselves a little bit further. 10,000 steps is a magic number that we will be aiming for. So, you know, watch the space. We are very carefully listening to the audience. No changes will, of course, happen without the governance vote. So these sort of fundamental changes in tokenomics from the very, very first day have always been taken as a result of a, you know, big votes. We actually had the biggest ever uh, governance vote in history of Web3, the vote on entering the U.S., uh, we had more than 380,000 people casting their vote. It's absolutely phenomenal. Engagement was absolutely huge. You guys, uh, your website says you have 140 million users and that you're the number two downloaded app in fitness uh, in 2022. Is that accurate? Absolutely. That's sweat coin. And Sweat Wallet has been number one in fintech or in sort of financial services section in like 30 different countries. And we have 10 million uh, users on Sweat Wallet. That's got to be like, you know, maybe they're not all obviously crypto users, but that's got to be one of the biggest kind of hybrid crypto Web3, Web2 apps out there. Is there anything even comparable? (laughs) I mean, uh, you know, MetaMask is probably bigger in terms of number of users, but in terms of active users, we are, you know, we're absolutely huge. If you go into that radar right now and look at rankings, you'll see that pretty much every day we'll be in top five. But we are in top five every day. There are quite a lot of projects that would spike for a day and then we disappear, but we're sort of consistently getting, you know, kind of top five, top three position. Crypto is is a great incentive uh, mechanism. And and I can really see with what you're doing, if you want to get people more active, there's so many ways you could do that. I see why you would want to go that direction. Have you ever thought about something like, I don't know, just pop my head, something like where somebody could take their tokens and like stake them. And then if they don't do a certain amount of steps, they get slashed. And so it's kind of like they set their own goals. Like, hey, I'm going to hit 10,000 steps every day for this month. And if I don't, you take half my month. Have you thought about anything like that? Or you guys have anything like that? Oh, you know, over the last 10 years, we've played with all the different mechanics. And while this is an incredibly powerful uh, mechanic, because it's a loss aversion, right? So if you're about to lose something, you know, kind of it's very motivating. Yeah. You know, there is one problem with that approach, which is once you lost, you disengage. That was a business called Pact uh, that had exactly sort of this business model. And people played and played while they were winning. As soon as once they failed, all of a sudden they would churn. And we, of course, want to make the world more physically active, not yesterday, but day in and out. And while loss aversion pushes you really hard on a short period of time, so if you will the stick, you know, kind of, it works, but you cannot will the stick for years and years and years. And we have you know, users who've been with us since 2015, 2016. So with building a stick, that never works. It's got to be a carrot. It's got to be motivation. It's got to be positive reinforcement of behavior as opposed to, you know, kind of beating them if they fail. So you're really into like the, the game theory, the psychology behind all that, even using the, the term lost aversion. That's like, that's what I see when I read uh, different marketing or, or psychology books, lost aversion is like a, a pretty big thing. Um, but you've obviously really thought this through and you're like, you're really motivated. We want to get people moving. Um, I, I guess, yeah. uh, you said the, the, the carrot works better. What, what are, what are the carrots for your app right now? Ooh, I, there are plenty, but actually, before we go into this, let me sort of paint a little bit bigger picture. Like why does it work and why does it work long-term? 
because uh, what we've done when we started this business, we actually borrowed page from another very, very big industry that in, in, the, in the Web3 world, we would have called this industry pay attention to earn. But we already know this industry is attention economy. Do you know that attention economy is estimated to be $7 trillion in size? It's five times bigger than the whole crypto combined. Bitcoin, Ethereum, absolutely everything. Huge. And we build it, humanity built it, over the last 150 years. And the interesting thing that it is built around the value of your attention. What we realized is that physical activity is extremely similar to attention on three aspects. First, both physical activity and attention are valuable to you. Everything, new information, new product, new person that you meet without paying attention, that will never happen. So, you know, it's an extremely valuable thing to you. Physical activity is also extremely valuable to you. You're in a better shape. You know, it helps you to get uh, uh, to have your mental health uh, in good shape. It, you know, kind of reduces your health care risks. It actually extends your life. So there is a humongous amount of benefits to you from physical activity as from attention. The second aspect is it is an extremely valuable action for third parties that are prepared to pay for it. So in case of attention, it's advertisers. In case of physical activity, it's your healthcare provider, it's your insurer, it's your employer. And in my case, you know, kind of even family members, because for example, I'm buying sweat of my kids at a very, very serious arbitrage because, you know, can, I value that physical activity <laughs> higher than the market values sweat at the moment. So there are interested parties that are prepared to pay for it. And the third aspect is both of them are scarce. You don't have an unlimited amount of attention and you don't have an unlimited amount of energy or time to be physically active. So you put these three things together and you kind of go, hmm, if we have attention economy, $7 trillion in size, why on earth would we not have movement economy built around value of physical activity? And why would it be any smaller than attention economy? Healthcare costs are ballooning and health is extremely valuable. Productivity is extremely valuable. Mental health is extremely valuable. Extending people's health span and making them economically and physically active for longer is extremely valuable. So like, hmm, you know what? We shouldn't be thinking about building a product. We should be thinking about building the whole new economy. And to speed up its creation so that we don't spend 150 freaking years building movement economy, we can speed it up by creating a token, an asset that allows you to exchange this value between different participants of this economy. And that's why, and this is why we develop sweat in a way that it is right now. Because basically, it is issued on the basis of your physical activity. And every next sweat demands from you more steps. That does two things. First of all, you very quickly realize that you need to move more and sooner because everyone is on the same curve. So you're competing with everybody, right? And the second thing, it allows us to have really interesting tokenomics where we constantly lowering down the emissions and inflation of monetary mass over long term is approaching zero. So it's fantastic to fulfill our mission to make the world more physically active and to build a sustainable economy. Now I'm coming to your point. Why do people value sweat? Because if you understand how valuable your physical activity is, you kind of go, holy shit, <laughs> you know what? I'm onto this because it's a free app. All I need to do is walk more. And then people take this bet, they start to become more physically active and they're accumulating an asset that is not going to go anywhere but up because of the simple fact we are getting fatter, we're moving less, and the value of physical activity is going to be increasing with time because all the innovation that we see right now is, you know, instead of walking, take a scooter. 
instead of commuting to work, use Zoom. So we are inventing all of these things that effectively just remove physical activity and calorie burn from our life. So having a counter initiative that actually motivates and incentivizes and turns physical activity into a tangible financial asset is incredibly, incredibly attractive for people. That's the main, by far, it's a linchpin of the, uh, of the motivation. And then around sweat, we have built a lot of utilities. You know, you can uh, win rewards. You mentioned staking. Well, don't call it staking because it's not staking in sort of a very, very classical sort of layer one or layer two way. It is, we call it grow jars because our users are not crypto natives and telling them staking, you know, like what the hell is that? But everyone knows savings account. Everyone knows, you know, kind of if you commit to something that you can actually benefit. So you put sweat into grow jar. And if you're active, you are earning more and more. It's like a, an accelerator of earning uh, from physical activity. Next thing is we have Sweat Hero, which is a um, like a mini game inside Sweat Wallet that allows you when you're stationary, because let's face it, I'm sitting at the desk right now, I'm not walking. But if you want to engage with physical activity, we allow you to play a game that is also valuing you taking steps, but with your fingers and on the screen. So there is a humongous amount of interest and a huge amount of engagement. And in order to play the game, you have to have sweat and in order to have sweat, you got to move. So, you know, kind of it so perpetuate mission, but also the value perception of sweat. We have just added trading that, you know, you pay for in sweat and you can go in and out of different crypto tokens directly inside the wallet. And I just got off a call with my product team. The roadmap for this year is absolutely phenomenal. I'm absolutely excited about it. You know, I already mentioned cross-chain or multi-chain, but we will also have an ability for you to pay your fees, not just on near with sweat. So imagine that you don't pay fees for, you know, transacting on chains. Uh, sorry, you pay your fees with your feet. You walk and all of a sudden your transactions are free. And by the end of this year, we will extend this functionality and this benefit for Sweat Wallet users past near to other chains. So we think it's going to be incredibly exciting uh, utility. So to sum it up, we have two parts to Sweat story. One, it has a very simple answer in the eyes of our consumers and market uh, observers. Why is it valuable? Because it's backed by the value of your physical activity. Can you imagine if physical activity is worthless? No single person ever said, no, it's worthless. So it is valuable. And then everyone is asking how much? And that is what we are trying to figure out. And then we add all of those utilities that I mentioned to make sure that we're creating engagement and you know value for sweat right now while we're building the second part of a narrative and we're starting to build movement economy and two and two together is a very very important mix so majority of our users when they earn sweat they put it in grow jars and they say look it's my physical activity i love it these guys gave me benefit because i am more active than i was before and i'm sitting on this asset i don't know how valuable it is going to be but you know, I've already got the benefit, so why would I go and dump it? So they are holding, and therefore tokenomics are really, really working. I have a couple things I want to touch on. The first one is you mentioned the attention economy, and you're trying to build this movement economy. So I'm kind of getting the, the picture that with sweat economy, you are it's almost like not just going to be about your app, but you're trying to maybe incentivize other people to come build apps within this ecosystem? Very much so. If you look at our light paper, uh, which was written already sort of two years ago, you would see that we are very much looking forward to work with other projects, and we already have a handful that we've spoken to. Basically, the way it's going to work is 
other projects that specialize in tracking other types of activity are going to be able to run movement verification oracles that will allow you to earn from other types of activity, cycling, swimming, high intensity training, weightlifting. And in order for these projects to become part of our ecosystem, of course, they will need to stake some sweat. So that is going to create an additional source of demand and utility for sweat in long term. There is another one that is a little bit less obvious and um, you know, it's going to take a little bit longer, I think, for us to get to its data. We are European company. Um, all the data that we have is kept inside Europe, which is governed by GDPR. You know that it's the most draconian privacy protection uh, kind of legal framework in the world. So we've never shared data of our users. We don't share data of our users, and we never will share data of our users. However, in Web3 world, you, you know, I'm sure that you're familiar with it and you've probably spoken to a bunch of this project. There is a concept of data union where user or the holder of the data can make a decision to release or make their data available for others to analyze in return for earning, you know, for, uh, for exposing this data. So we already spoken to a number of data unions, and over time, we would like to offer this as a service to our users. You flick a switch, and your very detailed physical activity data, depersonalized, is going to become available for you know, insurers, healthcare providers, and governments to be able to you know, kind of analyze what's happening. To give you one nugget of sort of information, you know, you probably know, uh, remember the horrors of the first few months of COVID when lockdowns came in and various different countries had different approaches to them. When Spain imposed one of the most draconian lockdowns of the whole world, we saw that within 48 hours, the country lost 85% of the physical activity. If you think about it, you can actually recalculate this into extra kilos of fat that people will acquire. You can recalculate it into extra healthcare costs that this will cost, et cetera, et cetera. So this data is immensely valuable. And given the huge coverage that we have and more than by now 150 million users, we believe that this is an incredible source of data which will generate huge amount of demand for sweat because of course in order to access this data the parties that are interested in analytics will have to pay in sweat okay okay I, you gave me an idea so you the loss aversion thing right like you don't want people to lose money what about they could take their sweat they stake it until they hit their goal so it unlocks on goal so like hey i'm gonna stake i'm gonna take 10 you know a thousand bucks and i'm gonna i'm gonna it gets converted to sweat i stake it until i've hit uh, you know, 500,000 steps, that does not unlock. I love it. I, I'm, I'm taking note. That's, that, that's <laughs> a really, really good idea. Very good idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, a after that, my, my next question was going to be about sustainability of sweat. Um, and you've gone into it a little bit, but just kind of wondering, like, over the long run, you know, you can't print tokens without a value prop you mentioned the analytics right analytics are paying for things in analytics what are the other like um ways that sweat stays sustainable long term and has some sort of is there any sort of mechanism for value accrual long term absolutely um we're one of the very very few projects well i i don't know any other if you do please tell me we became deflationary um already on the eight months of our existence and the reason for it is threefold. First of all, as I mentioned to you, every next step takes more steps to mint. So emissions are constantly declining. The second is we in this business for the last nearly 10 years. So we, unlike a lot of other projects that, you know, kind of were going down the path of buy an NFT, earn them, and, you know, kind of that it, it's, the mechanics are not as sustainable what well, they are working while people are banging on the door and trying to enter but as soon as the uh, number of new users dwindles 
all of a sudden they're entering that spiral. We're not going down that path. What we do is we monetize this audience and we are creating two things. First, we create humongous amount of revenue in sweat. So that sweat hero game, for example, we take tokens out of circulation. You know, we take fees for trading, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these, all of this sweat that we accumulate on constant basis, community votes on what to do with them. And so far, all the votes were to burn. So if you look at reducing supply or the reducing velocity of new tokens hitting the market, then you look at the amount of sweat that we can extract effectively as revenue from the system. And the third, we're also generating revenue not in sweat, that we have committed that 50% of our profits will go into buying token on the open market. Demand plus buying has already allowed us to keep our circulating supply dwindling for the last five months. And our projections are that we're not going to get out of this state. So despite our token not being capped, if you actually look at what matters, because if you're looking at the value, you put value divided by the number of tokens. The number of tokens in circulation declining, you know how you know can you know how it works. So I think that the advantage that we have over a lot of other projects is just the sheer amount of experience of building apps, knowing how to engage, knowing how to retain and knowing how to build features and products that excite people, make them want to, you know, kind of play with them, use them. And therefore, we're generating sufficient amount of revenue to kind of make the whole economy sustainable. So in the crypto space, it's often talked about, you know, that we need apps that, that actually help people that, you know, that are useful to the average person, because a lot of the apps in crypto are useful to people that are, that are into crypto, but outside the space, you know, nobody uses them. What would you say? I mean, obviously, you guys have been incredibly successful. You have this really successful app outside the space. What would you say to crypto builders today? Like, what are they doing wrong? And what should they be doing if they want to be the next app with 140 million users, whether that's on, you know, maybe decentralized social, maybe that's, um, you, you know, uh, the deep in industry, all these different things that are emerging. What are they doing wrong? And what could they be doing better? Uh, it's a brilliant question. And um, I've done a number of keynotes on, uh, uh, on this topic. Um, I'm not going to say what they're doing wrong because, you know, kind of, it, it's not my business uh, and it's none of my business to, to criticize people. But being an old fart uh, and remembering early days of internet, I can draw some parallels. And if you look back at internet of sort of 94, 95, 96, where roughly now, if we're looking at the user adoption as well as um, you know, kind of aggregate value of businesses engaged into Web3. We have somewhere between 97 of internet and 2002, 2003 of internet, somewhere in that ballpark. And that is a very interesting period in the development of internet because before sort of 97, most internet businesses had all the matter of weird and wonderful success metrics. You know, kind of, you know, they were measuring the weirdest things. And somewhere around 2000, the whole industry realized that the metric that mattered in order to scale was active users. And this is where I see one of the biggest barriers that we have right now in our own minds in Web3 because the metric that people chase is TVL. If you're chasing TVL, even if you have a brilliant idea to change the world and you know, kind of deal with millions of people, trouble with TVL, you start with going after millions of people, but then you quickly realize, shit, I mean, serving millions of people is hard. Finding millions of people is hard it's actually easier to attract 10 whales and you're probably going to get the, the same amount of TVL. So everyone very quickly slides off the mission 
and starts focusing on products that are designed for whales. And it becomes a zero-sum game because when whale pulls in money to you, they pull it out from another protocol. So this liquidity just sloshes around the system without growing the whole ecosystem, the whole Web3 industry. So the first advice that I would give is focus on active users, not on TVL. If you have active business with millions of users, TVL will come. The way I position it is, you know, we're building for Minos. Nobody serves Minos. Nobody is really thinking extremely hard how we're going to bring next billion people into the uh, kind of into this ocean. But guess what? If we have an ocean with a lot of minnows, whales will come. Where else are they going to go? Are they going to go in, you know, kind of, are they going to sit in their tiny little pond with other whales? No, you know, you want to have huge space with a lot of players. So if we want to build this business and follow in the wake of internet and become like, you know, as ubiquitous as internet right now, we need to focus on active users. The other advice that I would give is don't focus on financial products only. Think broader and bigger because if there is anything of value, whatever it is, that needs to be attached to ownership, it's not just money. There is a lot of other stuff. Then blockchain is a very, very cool solution for it. And it can 10x existing solutions that exist at the moment. So think of problems, big, big, big problems where somebody needs to own something. Ideally digital, but you know, I believe that over time we will get to a really tight link between digital ownership and physical ownership. And the last bit that I would say is please don't develop for web because you know kind of the more I travel around the world, the more I realize that you know it's just such a tiny second. You know, majority of people in the world don't have a computer. They don't even have laptop. Everyone's got mobile. So develop on the mobile, develop native apps, because then you're opening up a completely different segment. And these people are gagging to get into Web3. When we were analyzing our audience, we were concerned, you know, because we have a lot of moms, 55 plus. And we were like, you know what, do they really want to go into crypto? Because, you know, maybe they still remember Silk Road and all of the drug and, you know, illicit activity. No, I can tell you that nobody is saying no to crypto. The reason why they are not in Web3 is because of two big barriers. Barrier one, UX. And that includes language. You know, when we people go hodl, biddle, staking, finality, you know, woo. and if you put 24 words in front of them, and then there is a big red text that says, you got to write those down in a metal plate, split it into two, put it in safes in two different geographical locations. What on earth are you talking about? People don't want to go through this, right? They want to have an easy user experience. So that's one. And the second, if you go into Web3 right now in majority of products, if you endure that user experience and you got in, the first step that you need to take is to buy crypto. And typically, it's not buy $5 worth of crypto or $10 worth of crypto. You need to buy hundreds of dollars worth of crypto, especially if you're playing on Ethereum because, you know, two or three transactions can eat up the whole thing. People are not prepared to pay because what they have in their minds is Ronin Bridge is bridges uh, hacked for 600 million, wormhole 300 million. They are afraid of losing that money and they're not prepared to pay hundreds of dollars to be educated. What we give them is an incredible UX, free app, very easy way of onboarding without having to bother with the seed phrase in the first step. And they can literally walk into crypto. What we allow you to do is to take your first steps in Web3 by taking physical steps. You can learn how to transact. You can learn how to stake. You can learn how to um, um, trade on DEXs all inside our application. We have an education system that people are gagging for. Our lessons 
are getting like hundreds of thousands of participants uh, where we explain how this works, how that works, how layer ones work, you know, kind of, you know, what is the token? What is the value? People absolutely love this stuff because we are effectively an on-ramp. We're giving them an opportunity to come in easily and for free. And when they familiarize themselves and they go, wow, I get it, I understand, then they pull out their credit card and then they start actually playing. So, you know, I think that that would be my biggest tip. Think of the next billion people because if we're going to continue chasing these whales, you know, it's a zero-sum game. We are not going to become as ubiquitous as Internet. And I think we should aim for that. We need to be a heck of a lot more ambitious than we are right now. And example of us, we are not developing a product. We're not developing token. Our ambition is to build a whole new economy. And if attention economy is five times bigger than the whole crypto right now, I see astronomical potential for crypto because we, just we, will become of that size. And can you imagine what other projects, if they really, really focus on kind of big visions and they're really ambitious? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really bullish. I think you nailed it on the head. I felt like every single thing you said, I was like, wow, you're right. We need to focus on daily active users. We need to focus on mobile first. We need to do better UX, UI. I mean, these are the things that the industry needs to hear. And um, I'm, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, and, and it shows. Again, it shows because you, you have hit these things. Like you've been through the crucible. You've gotten to 140 million users. That is massive. Obviously, you know what you're talking about. And um yeah, if the industry wants to evolve past where it is, and if it wants to hit that next level, got to start dreaming bigger, thinking bigger, um, instead of playing these kind of back and forth games, like you're saying. I, I was going to ask you, what, what's next for Sweat Economy that you are like really excited about? The, the next thing you're looking forward to, you're like, I cannot wait for this thing I'm really excited about. <laughs> Ooh, there is a lot. Um, <laughs> I'm on token front, there is, uh, there is an incredible amount of work that is going right now because, I mean, our token is very unusual, as I mentioned, right? Because it's got a simple and intuitive answer why it is valuable. There aren't that many assets in digital space that have a very, very simple and easy answer to this question. Like, Bitcoin, it's digital gold. It's an anti-inflationary um, asset because it's got capped supply and it's got everyone's attention. So it's sort of in the stratosphere already. Layer one tokens have a very simple explanation because if you want to secure ownership of anything digital, you need to operate this sort of system. And to run a computer, you need electricity to operate this system you need to pay with this token. It's like an electricity for digital ownership securitization, right? Then there is stable coins, and those are very, very simple because there is, you know, in the most basic sense, there is $1 in the bank, and this represents $1. If I attribute value to $1, then, you know, and this is why one USDT or USDC is valuable to me. Beyond that, Tokens are kind of justifying their value through utility. But if you look at the history of assets through millennia, it worked in the opposite direction. First, something became valuable, then the utility appeared. You know, first, gold became valuable. We realized it's a color of the sun. It's beautiful in terms of uh, our ability to mend it and build beautiful things out of it. It does not corrode. It's very scarce. We started valuing gold, and then we figured out if we put it into equal pieces, then they become medium of exchange. Utility of exchange appeared after we realized that gold is valuable. So it is extremely important to have that nailed. And what we're doing right now, because our token is effectively the price of physical activity as perceived by the world, is that we're engaging huge number of academic institutions to help us 
well, community in a very unbiased and a sort of arm's length uh, way to come up with these estimates because every single estimate that we make here is suggesting that, you know, 5,000 steps are not worth one cent. They are a lot more valuable if you add the value of health care costs saved, productivity increase, mental health, you know, extending people's lives, reducing risk for insurers of you claiming on a health policy or a life policy, et cetera, et cetera. So we would like to, you know, we are running this grant campaign where we are basically giving money to different institutions to help us come up with various different estimates and we will engage our community so that we can paint this picture of the future. We know how much attention is worth right now. We will come up with an estimate. What is the long-term value of physical activity? Because we want more people to think how physical activity is valuable because it's going to make them more physically active. So that's one thing. It's a huge community and marketing program that we are kicking off right now. And the other side that I'm extremely excited about is us becoming multi-chain and allowing anyone on any chain to aggregate their liquidity in Sweat Wallet, whatever chain you're using, and being able to pay all of your fees with your feet. And I know how crypto natives are, you know, focused on fees and, you know, kind of cost of all of these transactions. And we would like to give them an incredible, you know, incentive to, to be able to cover all of those costs by being physically active. You don't want to pay that, you know, uh, that Ethereum fee, go and run a marathon. I think that some people will definitely <laughs> take it on. And that's going to create an incredible amount of value. So going cross chain and, you know, allowing sweat to become a gas across all chains is something that I'm really excited about this year. What is, uh, you guys, you mentioned you're, you've been built on Nier. Um, what has been your experience with that? Uh, have you guys had like a great, because Nier is like, it, I've heard a lot about it this year. Over 2023, it's like first time I'm, I was hearing about Nier all the time. What has been your experience on Nier? Because it, it seems like it's come out of nowhere and a lot of people are really excited about it and they've been doing some big things with DA and, and a couple other things. Um, what's been your experience? Yeah. Um, it's absolutely incredible. As I mentioned, we looked at 14 different chains and on balance, we've chosen Nier for three reasons. One is strategy and, you know, kind of not words, but the actual actions that underpin the strategy. Uh, everyone is talking about next billion people, probably ad nauseum now. Actually, it's a lot of people even stopped because, you know, they talk about it, but they can't do anything because, you know, how can you attract next billion people if your transaction cost is five bucks? In Africa, that's more than people earn per month. You know, you, what are you talking about? So there is a fundamental disconnect. On near, there is no disconnect. They have one of the highest throughputs that we were able to test. We got near to deliver 1,500 transactions per second for us continuously, which is throughput that we require. And it's not stopping. It's not falling over. And it's not sort of going offline for 17 hours. It's, you know, kind of, it's working. The second thing is a team, and the team of Nier is absolutely incredible. Ilya Palasukin is a friend. And do you know, small nugget, Ilya Palasukin co-authored the seminal white paper that kicked off the age of AI right now. Open AI draws its birth to the paper that's called Attention is All You Need that introduced generative pre-trained transformers to the world. Ilya Palasukhin, the founder of Nier, one of the two founders of Nier, co-authored that paper. So the guys are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, the brains, the, the skills, the, you know, the way they approach uh, their product is absolutely incredible. And they were able to, you know, to give us TGE where, you know, we were 10x bigger TGE than any project on any chain has ever done and near did not have any hiccups. And the third thing, of course, is just simple metrics, throughput, cost of transaction, and the fact that they're really focusing on UX. You know, they are spending so much time on trying to make their chain 
the easiest possible for the noob to engage with. And this is exactly our audience. They are like an on-ramp chain for Web3, and we are like an on-ramp on -ramp DAP for Web3. And this marriage is you know, absolutely perfect. We would not be able to build on any other chain right now. So if you're thinking about product for the next million people, you would be silly not to at least consider Near as a platform to build on. Man, I feel like Nier is going to take everything you just said and turn it into an ad. I'm, I'm like pumped. I'm like, man, I want to go. <laughs> I was going to build a project. I'm building on Nier right now. Um, uh, so, so you said that. You should. <laughs> <laughs> you said that the attention economy is seven trillion dollars. Um, I don't know if you said how big do you expect the movement economy to get in your mind over the next ten years or maybe twenty years? How, how big do you see it get? I mean, time time horizon is difficult for me, but it, but. It cannot be any smaller than that. Yeah, I, I, I think what you're doing, like, imagine that. Imagine, you know, uh, a world where it, it is bigger than that. It's like, you know, we have a $20 trillion economy around the movement economy. Everyone's physically fit. Everyone's healthy, happy, just full of joy. And like, man, that, that's a world you want to live in. You're talking about like utopia kind of status where um, you know, that, these are the kind of things we should be building toward. Um, not away from, right? M maybe building away from uh, people glued to their TVs all day. Maybe building toward this idea of people being healthy and, and fit and active and living longer lives. I, I love that. Absolutely. But it's also about fairness. There is one thing that bugs me in attention economy is mm. big tech. Um, do you know why big tech is big? Because they basically take your attention that is incredibly valuable. They sell it to the advertiser and they get the money for it but they give to you tiny little sliver of it in the shape of free products gmail this and that but the reason why they accumulated so much wealth is because they control monetization of your attention now i don't want movement economy to end up in the same screwed up state where we create humongous corporations that basically extract all this value with us getting just, you know, a bone of a free product. And that's where blockchain and token is extremely valuable because by tokenizing physical activity and giving it directly to you and us just taking tiny little sliver of it for effectively an enabling ecosystem is a fairer, way of distributing wealth because you are benefiting from your physical activity as opposed to enriching some big corporation that figured out a really really clever business model yeah it's crypto is amazing in that way that it's, it's almost like this credibly neutral resource or layer for the entire planet where you can build all kinds of things that no one owns nobody has control over that and it, it gives so much back to humanity. So you're like open finance, right? Normally the governments of the world, they control the financial systems within their countries and they do a really bad job. It's like one player, uh, pl you're playing Monopoly and one player can take as much money as they want from the bank. What do you think they're going to do? They're going to take as much money as they need. You know, like they're going to invent reasons to take money because, you know, they, they can do it. And then and, they can behave <laughs> irresponsibly because if you're yeah. too big to fail, nobody's going to allow you to fail. So we have this absolute jeopardy situation where you know kind of all of a sudden everyone else is suffering while the ones that have taken biggest risks and taken the biggest chunks off the table are the ones that you know getting constantly saved and protected that's where we're at right now in the us you know my parents generation my grandparents generation they could just work a job uh, go buy a house and and they were good they could vacation you know live live a pretty awesome life you get to my generation and below, it's like, you can't do that anymore. That's why so many people are gambling on, on these meme coins and things like that. It's because they, they don't have another path to actually live the American dream that they were sold as a kid. Uh, because there's been so much monetary debasement and, uh, you know, wages haven't caught up to, to that inflation. And that it comes down to the fact that the government has run 
the the monetary system into the ground. But you have this credibly neutral layer with crypto where nobody nobody can do that. You, it's an open system where you have an, an open market of entrepreneurs and, and builders who say, hey, we're going to build the best financial system possible. And in the future, you know, you're going to have, I think you're going to have like third world countries saying, hey, uh, our our system doesn't work very good. We're going to just tap into this open finance system. And then you're going to see them thrive because suddenly their citizens uh, can store wealth and that wealth grows. And they're not, you know, having to rush to the store to buy groceries because inflation is so bad. And, you know, entrepreneurs are going to flock to their builders are going to go there and, and they're going to see a lot of innovation in that country. And those countries are going to be the powerhouses, the ones that remain on these you know, antiquated systems run by governments. Government doesn't do anything good, pretty much. You know, DMV, right? And uh, they're they are going to be ones that are going to lag behind over time. And uh, I think we're going to see a shift in power towards these open systems, uh, where, whether it's movement economy, social media, um, big tech, or, or finance. So yeah, man, we're on the same page. I, I'm <laughs> I'm pumped about those things. But there is a, um, one one other aspect to add to the narrative that you just shared, which I totally agree with. Uh, it's education of uh, people. You know, we ended up in a very, very strange situation where by having all of these trusted parties that, you know, take a lot of decisions without, you know, kind of consulting with us on our behalf, like how much money to print or, you know, do I feel like paying my, um, you know, account holders uh, today or, you know, do I want to, run with this money uh, abroad and live on some private island, you know, kind of where trust is uh, broken. The What I absolutely love about blockchain is the fact that, you know, it puts you into a seat of responsibility. You know, we do need to improve UX, but what I love that you control the keys and you can have, you know, from one cent to billions on your device without you having to kind of go to somebody and say, could you please store it on my behalf and then hope that they don't run away with it. So that puts people in the driver's seat. That makes you responsible. That makes you need to understand more things. And what we need in this space to do is to help people and take it step by step, not demand from them an immediate, you know, operational security literacy where, you know, kind of they understand every nook and cranny of how to, you know, store seed phrases and, you know, what's the difference between private key and public key. But we can take them step by step. You can link your account to your email. You accumulated some assets. Now, you know, kind of learn this bit and this bit and this bit and increase level of security of your account all the way to sort of pushing people into, you know, understanding what Ledger is and how it provides you an additional layer of uh, security so that nobody ever, even with, you know, very, very serious kind of hacking abilities can ever get uh, get to your assets. So that putting people in driver's seat gives me a very, very good feeling because we are not nanny state. We're not telling people, trust us. It's going to be all right. No, you know, saying don't trust us. You know, you are in charge, you're in control, and you do whatever whatever you want with it. We need more skeptical, just like people thinking for themselves. And what, what you're saying, I think, is that this kind of is a, is a step in that direction where, where suddenly people have this responsibility thrust upon them. And we need to incrementally keep turning up that responsibility so people are, are, are not shoving the responsibility to governments and and these people who are, are just going to abuse that trust um and and continuing to build trustless systems where you don't even need trust um because <laughs> yeah people tend to do that uh, I, I was going to ask you just for fun uh has nothing to do necessarily with sweat but i guess it could have to do with moving economy what apps or projects get you excited right now are you are you seeing that are in the space and you're like that's pretty cool what they're building hmm good question Very good question. I think I am very excited about some aspects of GameFi. Um, I think games have done or have made a lot of mistakes over the last few years um, with the, you know, kind of with this NFT that gives you right to earn because that sort of sends a signal that you can become rich by playing games. And it's an overpromise, and, you know, it's been spectacularly under-delivered on. But what I see right now 
is that games are starting to kind of retrench or turn to back to their roots where they're focusing on really, really good gameplay, but they're finding really elegant and really cool ways of building this assets that I can own and I can transfer between games or I can transfer to other people that enhance the gameplay and enhance the perceived value of the game. So I'm not playing the game to become wealthy or even out, you know, augment my income, but I'm playing a game because it's an amazing game, but there is this icing on a cake. There is an additional engagement thing that comes from fungible and non-fungible tokens used in, uh, uh, used in them. So I think that some games really, really uh, give me quite a lot of excitement. The other thing that I'm really excited about is the space that we're in, which is self-custody wallets. I believe that the future is going to be that people would want to be kind of in charge and in control of their assets rather than hoping that somebody else does this job for them and then discovering that they haven't. And making amazing user experience on mobile that allows people to own anything and everything uh, without having to trust anybody is absolutely the future. I believe that the share of centralized uh, kind of uh, financial system in Web3 is going to decline and the share of self-custody uh, where I control my assets is going to increase. And we definitely want to be sort of on the, uh, on the crest of uh, this wave. If people want to learn more about Sweat Economy, what you guys are building uh, and what you guys are up to, where's like the best place they could go? Is it Twitter, Discord, the app? Yeah, well, of course, uh, I would I, I would recommend to install <laughs> Sweatcoin and then Sweat Wallet. You know, kind of, I, I believe that Look, all of us, even if you don't care about crypto, just be more active. Your life is going to be better. You're going to be in a better mood. You're going to live longer. You know, can, even if you're not interested in financial value of it. But I think that all of us need to be interested in creation of this um, movement economy because, you know, attention created $7 trillion of value that did not exist before. I think that creating whole new economies is extremely exciting because we all can benefit from it. So, of course, I would say, you know, install those apps. But to stay abreast with our latest news, uh, go to Twitter, uh, Sweat Economy. Uh, we have Telegram uh, community, also Sweat Economy. And, yeah, I am on Twitter. I'm very, very active. Uh, you know, I love getting into conversations and, you know, answering people's questions. Uh, it's going to be O-L-E-G, Oleg, underscore F-E-M. Uh, yeah, just keep us up there. As always, none of this was investment advice. Uh, you know, none of this is us telling you to go buy sweat or to do anything. Go buy crypto. Crypto's risky. Sweat's risky. Everything's risky. Um, and I am personally a holder of sweat. That's just a, maybe a disclosure you should be aware of. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? I mean, you know, you know, sweat better than me. Uh, sweat economy is. Is there anything that like you're excited about or that I didn't ask about that that I should have? Um, no, but I, you know, I would, I would, I'd love to leave this with the kind of with a question uh, to to people. Like, you know, how valuable do you think your physical activity is? Like genuinely, do you think it's worthless? Do you think it's fair that you know, kind of, you know, if if you're active and you're pushing yourself, that you're actually not getting anything in return, and instead you have to pay uh, for your gym, for your kit, everything. So I, you know, kind of that, that's that's a question that I sort of leave the audience with. <laughs>